but unholy cow. And we're looking at a very interesting uh, story that took place at Mount Sinai as the people of Israel were gathered there before the Lord. Um, the chapter is a little bit on the lengthy side, but I would encourage you to turn in your Bibles to this chapter. You can grab a pew Bible as well and find uh, this uh, chapter and follow along as I read it. Exodus chapter 32. Now when the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, the people assembled about Aaron and said to him, Come, make us a God who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Aaron said to them, Tear off the gold rings which are in the ears of your wives, your sons, and your daughters, and bring them to me. Then the people tore off the gold rings which were in their ears and brought them to Aaron. He took this from their hand and fashioned it with a graving tool and made it into a molten calf. And they said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. Now when Aaron saw this, he built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. So the next day they rose early and offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and to drink and rose up to play. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, Go down at once, for your people whom you brought up from the land of Egypt have corrupted themselves. They have quickly turned aside from the way which I commanded them. They made for themselves a molten calf and have worshipped it and have sacrificed to it and said, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you up from the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I have seen this people, and behold, they are an obstinate or, or stiff-necked people. Now then let me alone, that my anger may burn against them, and that I may destroy them, and I will make of you a great nation. Then Moses entreated the Lord his God and said, O Lord, why does your anger burn against your people, whom you have brought out from the land of Egypt with great power and with a mighty hand? Why should the Egyptians speak, saying, With evil intent he brought them out to kill them in the mountains and to destroy them from the face of the earth? Turn from your burning anger and change your mind about doing harm to your people. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, your servants to whom you swore by yourself and said to them, I will multiply your descendants as the stars of the heavens, and all this land of which I have spoken, I will give it to your descendants, and they shall inherit it forever. So the Lord changed his mind about the harm which he said he would do to his people. Then Moses turned and went down from the mountain with the two tablets of the testimony in his hand, tablets which were written on both sides. They were written on one side and the other. The tablets were God's work, and the writing was God's writing engraved on the tablets. Now when Joshua heard the sound of the people as they shouted, he said to Moses, There is a sound of war in the camp. But he said, It is not the sound of the cry of triumph, nor is it the sound of the cry of defeat, but the sound of singing, I hear. It came about as soon as Moses came near the camp that he saw the calf and the dancing, and Moses' anger burned, and he threw the tablets from his hand and shattered them at the foot of the mountain. He took the calf which they had made and burned it with fire and ground it to powder and scattered it over the surface of the water and made the sons of Israel drink it. Then Moses said to Aaron, What did this people do to you, that you have brought such great sin upon them? Aaron said, Do not let the anger of my Lord burn. You know the people yourselves, yourself, that they are prone to evil. For they said to me, Make a God for us who will go before us. For this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. I said to them, Whoever has any gold, let them tear it off. So they gave it to me, and I threw it into the fire, and out came this calf. Now when Moses saw that the people were out of control, 
For Aaron had let them get out of control to be a derision among their enemies. Then Moses stood at the gate of the camp and said, Whoever is for the Lord, come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered together to him. He said to them, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, Every man of you shall put his sword upon his thigh and go back and forth from gate to gate in the camp and kill every man his brother and every man his friend and every man his neighbor. So the sons of Levi did as Moses instructed, and about 3,000 men of the people fell that day. Then Moses said, Dedicate yourselves today to the Lord, for every man has been against his son and against his brother in order that he may bestow a blessing upon you today. On the next day, Moses said to the people, You yourselves have committed a great sin, and now I am going up to the Lord. Perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Then Moses returned to the Lord and said, Alas, this people has committed a great sin, and they have made a god of gold for themselves. But now, if you will, forgive their sin. If not... Please blot me out from your book, which you have written. The Lord said to Moses, Whoever has sinned against me, I will blot him out of my book. But go now and lead the people where I told you. Behold, my angel shall go before you. Nevertheless, in the day when I punish, I will punish them for their sin. Then the Lord smote the people because of what they did with the calf which Aaron had made. There's a a, a lot of information in this chapter, a lot of very interesting details. There's a lot of things we could focus on that we won't have the time to do this morning. What I hope to do is touch on some of the main points regarding what we find written for us here in Exodus chapter 32. And so we're going to begin by focusing on probably the obvious, and that is the idolatry that the people engaged in. And it was a very blatant idolatry. And as we consider some of the things about how this idol worship came about and how they, how, what they were doing with this idol, there's a few things that we should notice. And first of all, we should notice that the people engaged in this blatant idolatry very quickly. It didn't take long for them to do the exact opposite of what God had already told them to do. Back in, If you look at verse 8 in this chapter, as the Lord is telling Moses up on the mountain what the people were doing down at the foot of the mountain, the Lord said to Moses, they have quickly turned aside from the way which I have commanded them. You see, a couple weeks ago when we were in Exodus chapter 20, we looked at the Ten Commandments, and the very first commandment that God gave the people of Israel was, you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol. You shall not worship them or serve them. And here the people of Israel, in Moses' absence, have very quickly turned to idol worship. They did the exact opposite of what the Lord commanded them there in that first commandment. Now if we look at verse 1, we see how this came about. It says that the people, um, when they saw that Moses had delayed to come down from the mountain, they came to Aaron. And so if you can imagine this scenario where Moses is taking his time on the mountain, it's been day after day after day, Exodus chapter 24 tells us that he was up there 40 days, and the people are getting impatient. Where is Moses? Why is he taking so long? What is he doing up there? And he's not coming down, they're getting impatient, and so they turn to Aaron, his brother, who we could probably consider kind of second in command at that point, They come to Aaron and say, Make us a God who will go before us. As for this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. Imagine that. Just days after God had given them the commandments, which included a commandment prohibiting idolatry, here the people are trying to get Aaron to make them a God to worship in Moses' absence. Now, if you think about that phrase, make us a God who will go before us, a God that you can make is no God. Think about this. 
In just a short time, golden earrings and rings were fashioned into some object, and the people were willing to worship that and assume that this object had power. A god that you can make is no god at all. But very quickly, the people turned to idolatry. We can also see the seriousness of this idolatry. As the Lord spoke to Moses in verse 7, he described the people as having become corrupted. And we see in verse 9 that the Lord called the people obstinate or stiff-necked, your your version might read. And that's kind of an interesting picture, this idea of of stiff-necked. We find it throughout the Old Testament and even in the New Testament. But if you can picture, maybe you got an, an ox and has a, the ox has a yoke on him, right? You know, the thing to try to control the ox. And maybe you have a field to plow and you're trying to get the ox to go down straight rows back and forth and plow the field. You know, whoever is guiding this ox would, would have a way to pull on that thing, right? You can tell I'm not from a farm. I don't know the lingo. Okay? But whoever's controlling the animal would have ways to pull on these things to turn the head of the beast that he's trying to control to get him to go in the direction that he wants him to go. That's the the picture here. Only the picture here is that of like an ox, or if you want to think of riding a horse and you got, is it a bridle? Is that what you call it? Reins. Okay. This is bad. I should just stop. Okay. But if you can picture an animal who is resisting what you're wanting him to do, Okay? That's the picture of what's going on here with the people of Israel. God is trying to lead them in a new and good direction, a direction that includes worshiping Him and being faithful to Him and serving Him alone, and the people are resisting. They're not following God's leading as He would lead them down a good path for them, and down new ways for them. And so the Lord describes them as having become corrupted and stiff-necked or obstinate. Now you can see it. Moses understood the seriousness of this sin too. He called it a great sin later on in the chapter. The idolatry that the people were engaged in was a really big deal. Now look at verse 5 with me. Uh, excuse me, verse 6. It says that the next day, okay, after, make, after Aaron made this idol, it says that, that they rose early... They offered burnt offerings and brought peace offerings, and the people sat down to eat and drink, and they rose up to play. This is all part of this worshiping of this golden calf, this this idol that that Aaron had made. Now, there's something we need to notice about this, okay? They, They were willing to wake up early to be involved in this idolatry, okay? A lot of people aren't willing to get up early unless it's something they're they're, they're serious about, right? They were willing to get up early. They were celebrating and feasting. They sat down to eat and drink, and it says that they rose up to play. Now, those who are good with the Hebrew language, the language in which the Old Testament was written, know that this phrase that we have in English, rose up to play, is a phrase that includes sexual connotations. So in other words, they were involved in sexually immoral dancing and acts with this golden calf that had been made. Now, if you've seen the movie The Ten Commandments, which really recounts the book of Exodus, here's here's the way that they portray this event. And you can see this golden calf that had been fashioned, the people gathered around dancing and celebrating. You can even get a sense of the sexual nature of it, too, from the way that this was portrayed in the movie. But imagine this. Here's Moses on the mountain with God, and, and God, of course, sees what's going on. And he says to Moses, look at what's going on with these people. They very quickly turned to idolatry. It was very serious. And another thing we can note about this idolatry is that Aaron was very much involved in it. He helped them along. Notice that as they came to him and made these demands, make us a God, he gave in right away. In fact, he even instructed the people what to do. Give me the golden rings from your ears. Whoever's wearing them, bring them to me. Now, they probably got this gold from Egypt because we're told that as the people of Israel left slavery in Egypt, that they plundered the people. The people were like, get out of here after all these plagues. And they gave them stuff and just trying to get them out of here. 
They plundered the people of Egypt as they left, and so this gold was probably gold that they had gotten from the Egyptians because they were formerly slaves. Now, this golden calf that they made was probably similar to one of the gods of the Egyptians. The Egyptians had many, many, many gods. They worshipped the Nile River. They worshipped the sun. In fact, they thought that, that uh, cows, there was some, something divine about cows even. There was a bull god named Apis, A-P-I-S, an Egyptian god that they worshipped. And so th this golden calf that was created was probably repre uh, represented one of the Egyptian gods. So they're using gold of Egypt to make a god of Egypt, and here they are being helped by Aaron, who should have been the one resisting this and calling the people to faithfulness. In fact, if you look at verse 5, after the object had been made, this idol, Aaron says, it says that Aaron built an altar before it, and Aaron made a proclamation and said, tomorrow shall be a feast to the Lord. Isn't that strange? You know what I think Aaron is doing here? Is he is trying to mix forbidden idolatry with the worship of the one true God. But that would have been the Egyptian way to do it. If you think this God can help you, add him to the mix. If you think this God can help you, take this one too. Aaron, it seems, was trying to promote the mixture of idol worship with the worship of the one true God. And so if you look at verse 21 and following, Moses comes to Aaron, and isn't this, isn't this interesting? Aaron, Moses said to Aaron, What did this people do to you, that you have brought such great sin upon them? Boy, if you were Aaron at this point, you probably wanted to crawl in a hole and die, rather than have Moses come and confront you about this. But he says, What in the world has happened that you have led the people into this idolatry? Look at what Aaron said. Do not let the anger of my Lord, and he's referring to Moses there, my Lord. Do not let the anger of my Lord burn, burn. You, you know yourself, Moses, that these people are prone to evil. Do you know what Aaron was doing? He was blaming the people. That's what he was doing. Moses, you know what they're like. So don't come and, and, and accuse me here of, of, of what's going on. You know what they're like. They would have done it without me, is what he's trying to say. He's trying to excuse himself from, from this idolatry. But then notice what he goes on to say. They said to me, make a God for us who will go before us. For this Moses, the man who brought us up from the land of Egypt, we do not know what has become of him. So verse 24, he said, I said to them, whoever has any gold, let them tear it off. So they gave it to me, and I threw it into the fire... And out came this calf. Just like, threw it in there and voila, here's the golden calf. You know what Aaron is essentially trying to convince Moses of? That a miracle happened. I threw gold into the fire and boom, here came this golden calf. Now how in the world Aaron thought Moses would believe this stuff I mean, it, it's an incredibly ridiculous story that Aaron made up. But notice verse 25, and I think this really sums it up well. Aaron had let the people get out of control. Aaron was not exercising leadership. Rather, he was giving in to what the people in their evil hearts were desiring. Now, Secondly, this leads Moses to be in a position where he had to plead with God to spare the people. Even before he came down the mountain, he's pleading with God to spare the people. Verse 10, as the Lord was, was speaking to him and telling him what was going on, notice what the Lord said, Leave me alone that my anger may burn against them and that I may destroy them. And I will make of you a great nation. So what the Lord is essentially telling Moses here is I'm going to destroy all of them and we're going to start all over with you. Now we can see that Moses rejected this idea. 
But if we think about this for a little bit, maybe you're thinking, well, how in the world and why in the world would God do that? Because God had made all these promises to Abraham, right? Through you, I'm going to bless you. You're going to have all these descendants. Through you, all nations of the earth will be blessed. I will make you great and your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky and the sand and the seashore. And so we think about this and we're like, well, how in the world and why in the world would God be willing to do that? But here's what's going on, okay? Hundreds of years earlier, God gave the promise to Abraham and Abraham's son Isaac, and Isaac's son Jacob, and then you got the 12 sons, and they end up in Egypt and finally set free from slavery in Egypt. So hundreds of years earlier, God gave this promise. Since Moses was one of the descendants of of Abraham, God could have eliminated the rest, started over with Moses, and still have been faithful to the promise he made to Abraham, because Moses was one of the descendants. God could have gotten rid of all of them, started over with Moses, and his faithfulness to his promises would have continued. That's what God was saying to Moses. And I think it's very remarkable that Moses wouldn't have said in a moment of pride, yeah, that's a good plan. I mean, can you imagine how in a moment of pride you'd say, yeah, look at those awful people down there. Destroy them, God. Start over with me. It'd be so much better. I know it would. What a great idea. But Moses didn't do that. Rather, he, he, he pleaded with God that God would spare the people. He points out God's recent action in sparing the people from slavery in Egypt. Look at, Lord, what you've already done. Look at how you've saved them from slavery in Egypt. And, Lord, what if the Egyptians hear about this? What are they going to think? They're going to think, man, how, how nice that God would set them free from them being our slaves only to take them out in the wilderness and kill them all. And so Moses is pleading with God to spare the people. And in verse 32, the next day, when Moses went back up to the Lord, he said to the people, you know, perhaps I can make atonement for your sin. Moses was even willing to have his name blotted out of the book that the people would be forgiven. Moses was willing to give himself in exchange for the people. What a difference between leadership, a difference of leadership between Moses and Aaron. Moses was willing to even give himself in exchange for the people for forgiveness. Now Moses pleading with God did spare the people from being destroyed. But that did not mean that the people would not face any consequences for their sin. And in fact, they did face many consequences for their sin. First of all, they had to face Moses himself. And even as Moses came down, it was very obvious to everyone that he was angry. And I believe that this anger that Moses had was a righteous anger against sin, not a a sinful anger. But we can see in Moses that, that good leaders are willing to confront and deal with sin. Not sweep it under the rug, not ignore it, not go along with it. Good leaders are willing to deal with sin, and that's exactly what Moses did. Now, in verse 19, it tells us that Moses was carrying the, 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 the stone tablets, right? And he gets to the bottom of the mountain, and it says that he, he smashed them at the foot of the mountain. These would have been the tablets upon which God had written with his finger the Ten Commandments. And I believe that Moses breaking these stone tablets at the foot of the mountain represented how the people had broken God's law. It's as though they had taken those tablets and smashed them at the foot of the mountain and said, we don't care what you have just said to us, we will do as we please. I think Moses' action represented how the people had broken God's law. But then we read in verse 20, Moses destroyed this idol, he burned it with fire, he ground it to a powder and scattered it over the water, and then he made the people drink it. I'm guessing that that water tasted pretty terrible, having been polluted by this gold. But I think that Moses forcing them to drink this water represented how they had become polluted by their own sin. Moses was dealing with these sinful people. We also see that another consequence for their sin was that the Levites, who sided with Moses, ended up killing 3,000 men with the sword. So Moses says at the gate, "Whoever whoever is on the Lord's side, come over here with me, the Levites come. 
And Moses tells them that the Lord has instructed them to go and, and take their sword and kill. I think the Levites showed a, a great amount of, of dedication and zeal for the Lord and, and being willing to step forth in the way that they did. This must have been a really terrible day, though, as they went through the camp and killed 3,000 men with a sword. And I think the sense here in, in, of what is written here is that, hey, you know what? Whether it's a son or a neighbor or a friend of yours, if they've been involved in this idolatry, you are not to let those kind of relationships get in the way of executing this judgment from God. Now, I think that the 3,000 men who were killed probably represented a very small percentage of those who had been involved in the idolatry. And it would seem to me that most likely these 3,000 men were probably the ringleaders of this crime against God. They were probably some of the ones who had come to Aaron initially and said, make us a God. We don't know what's up with this Moses guy. They were probably some of the ones who were leading the people in that, in that sexually immoral worship of this golden calf on that next day. Those 3,000 men were probably the ringleaders. But notice in verse 35, the people also suffered from some sort of plague. And it doesn't tell us what it is. But it simply says in verse 35 that the Lord smote the people. Or that the Lord sent a plague upon the people. And what it is, we don't know, because we aren't told. But I think Warren Wearsby summarizes it very well. He says, God knew who all the guilty people were, and God would punish them in his own way and in his own time. You know, it's really hard to read this chapter and not think, what in the world were these people doing? Did you think that today? Every time I read this, I think that. What in the world were they doing? But you know, the, the more I think about it, I think that's when the Holy Spirit would remind me of a few important things. First of all, the Holy Spirit reminds me how quickly I too can turn to sin. And that's why we find this warning given in 1 Corinthians 10, which we read this morning. Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. It would be wrong for us to look at this passage today and say, what a bunch of stupid, foolish people. I'm glad I'm not like them. How quickly we too can know what the Lord says, what we ought to do and not, ought not to do, and then just a little bit later, here we are doing the exactly the opposite of what the Lord has said. The Holy Spirit also reminds me how desperately I need help to resist temptation to sin. And I think that's part of what is being indicated in that very next verse in 1 Corinthians 10. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is common to man. And God is faithful will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able, but with the temptation will provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. We are not destined in the sense that we could do nothing but sin in that regard. The promise here is that the Lord will help us resist temptation to sin. He will help us if we will but seek his help. I need God's help, and so do you, to resist the temptations that come our way to sin against the Lord. Thirdly, the Holy Spirit reminds me how I constantly need forgiveness because I do sin each day. And I love the words of Isaiah chapter 1. For the Lord says, Come now and let us reason together. Though your sins are as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they will be like wool. And isn't it an amazing thing that the God 
against whom we have sinned is willing to forgive our sin. Though our sins are as scarlet, he'll make it as white as snow. You see, God who is holy must deal with sin. God is a just God and he must punish sin. And the reason why we can experience forgiveness is because Jesus has experienced the wrath of God for sin in our place. That is why we can turn to Jesus, trusting in him. That is why we can come to God and ask for forgiveness and God will grant that to us. Because Jesus has paid the price for our sin. And as we go through life, we dare not become proud and think, that would never be me. We need to recognize how much we need God's help to resist temptation. And when we find ourselves having sinned against God, we need to run to him, confessing our sin and seeking his forgiveness. There's important stuff for us to learn today from this chapter. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for giving us the Bible. And Lord, some of these stories are are not only very interesting, but they speak very powerfully into our lives today. And Lord, you know where each one of us is at. Lord, you know what's going on in our lives, in our hearts. Lord, I pray that you would so work in each of our lives that we would see just how desperately we need your forgiveness for our sin. And that you would encourage and, and strengthen us, Lord, so that when we are faced with the temptation to sin, that we would say no, that we would seek your help, that you would provide that way of escape. But Lord, we know that our experience will be that each day we do not follow you perfectly, that each day we will need your forgiveness. And so, Father, thank you that you grant that to us through faith in Jesus. We praise you, Lord, for what you've done to save us from our sin. And it is in your name that we pray. Amen.